in the book of Mark, amen, chapter 8, verse 22 through 26. And I, I, I'm going to read out of the message this morning because I like the way the message put it. And it reads like this. I'm going to read verse uh, uh, from here. It says, They arrived at Bethsaida. Some people brought a sightless man and begged Jesus to give him a healing touch. Taking him by the hand, he led him out of the village. He put spit in the man's eyes, laid hands on him, and asked, Do you see anything? Now, verses 24 through 26 says, He looked up. He goes, I see men. They look like walking trees. So Jesus laid hand on his eyes again. It says, The man looked hard and realized that he had recovered perfect sight, saw everything in bright 2020 focus. Then Jesus sent him straight home, telling him, don't enter the village. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We ask you, God, that you would just have your way this morning, Father, that I would step aside and you would use me to teach your word this morning, God. Lord, encourage us, God, that we can go out, God, and continue to do what you called us to do, Father. We come against any distractions, God, and even those watching on our YouTube channel, my God, I pray that you would just strengthen them and comfort them, God. You would encourage them through your word this morning, Father, and we're careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. So I titled this, Do You See Anything? Because as the scripture said here, where we read, uh, uh, Jesus laid um, his hands on him. And one translation says he spit in his eyes. So when you look at the whole story here that was taking place, this is the only time where Jesus actually spit in a man's eyes. Other times he spit in the mud, he spit in the dirt, then he put it in a man's eyes. And, and so I'm looking at this and I'm like, man, this is, this is crazy. You know, I mean, it, 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 it was, I, what chapter am I saying? Chapter 8, verse 22 and 26. And so Jesus had come to a town called Bethsaida. And uh, while he was there, the whole story goes, some friends, they brought a blind man to be healed. Amen. And, and that's not unusual because Jesus healed people through the Bible. He healed lepers. He healed crippled. He raised people from the dead. Uh, so it doesn't really seem like, okay, that's what Jesus does. But and the blind man received their sight. In Matthew, it says 11, verse 15, it says, The blind man received their sight, the lame walk." Leopards are cleansed, the dead hear, and it says the dead are raised. So we're used to Jesus doing miracles. But on this time, it says that he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he put spit in his eyes, you know, uh, the man wasn't healed the first time. So this is the first story uh, uh, where Jesus didn't heal a person in the first step. You know, so we can look at the story and say, man, what, what's going on here? You know, Jesus didn't heal him the first time. He's not healed because he goes, I see men, but I still see blurry. And so uh, uh, we can look at it and we said, man, it's not really impressive because Jesus, he normally heals people. They get healed. But on this time, it took Jesus two times to heal the man. And so when you look at the story, how many know that Jesus wasn't having a bad day. It's not like, okay, I had a bad day, so it didn't work to, today. You know, uh, there, there was something else going on. When Jesus does stuff in the Bible, he does it intentionally. He's trying to teach. Uh, uh, he was a rabbi, so rabbis, what they do is they go out and they understand they got students, so they're always trying to teach people with the purpose. So when Jesus was here, he could have healed them like that the first time. But he was trying to teach his disciples something. So if we look at the story closer, it says that in verse 22 and 23, some people brought a sightless man to Jesus. And, and so we're able to see, okay, that's normal stuff there. And, and, and so well, what's wrong with that? Jesus brought a man. Jesus was doing all this stuff. And, and so there's a, a number of unusual facts that are going on here. It's only recorded in the book of Mark. All the other gospels, it's not recorded. And it's the only time Jesus healed someone in stages. And the only time Jesus actually spit on someone. But in Mark 7, we, we find out there that the deaf man with the speech impediment, uh, Jesus putting his fingers into the man's ears and spitting on his fingers, that was a healing. But he didn't spit in his face. John chapter 9, Jesus healed a man born blind. He spit on the ground, made mud, and then he put it in the man's eyes and he was healed. But in this text, it says the only time Jesus literally spit on anyone. And so, so this should make us say, well, what's going on here? Jesus did something that he never did yet for the first time. 
And it's a two-stage miracle. He didn't do it the first touch, and they had to take second touch. I mean, second touch. So we find out here after the first touch, the man's still blurry. You know, because then it's sometimes like us believers, God comes and touch us, and we still can't see his purpose for our life. It's still a blur. God, I don't know what you want me to do. It wasn't until Jesus touched him a second time where he was able to see. So Jesus here, he was trying to teach his disciples something. So the story goes deeper than that. And, and so when we look at it, okay, Jesus, why did you heal in stages? What, what's taking place here? And if we go back to the beginning of Mark chapter 8, we have the miracles of the feeding uh, of the 4,000 in verses 1 through 10. After that, we, we find that the Pharisees came to argue with him in verse 11 and 12. And then in verse 15 of Mark chapter 8, Jesus and the disciples got into the boat and Jesus warns them. He says he warned them to beware of the leaving of the Pharisees. But leaving, in the other words, was used for yeast and baking. And so, but at this time when he taught them in, in verse 15, he was referring it to the false teaching of the Pharisees. So he was trying to warn his disciples that, hey, you, you're listening to the false teaching of the Pharisees. And so after all this story, we, in verse 18, he says, Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? And he says that in verse 18. So when we come to the story that we read, Jesus is not only healing this person, he's dealing with his disciples in other words, he's telling the disciples, how can you be so blind after being with me for so long, you don't understand anything I'm saying? It was a two miracle. And so his disciples are always seeing Jesus heal people. And so before they got to the place here in the story where we read, he warned the disciples, hey, you're listening to a false doctrine. And so now he's trying to teach his disciples because the disciples were not still understanding it amen and so he's telling a friends brought somebody how many know our friends can bring us closer to god or further from god when you get around friends we all got two types of friends friends that always hey you don't have to be sold out eh? you don't have to be committed or we got those man i'm glad man i'm happy for you that you're doing good now because you were messed up you know eh? and so we got friends like that friends that are either going to move us closer to god or take us away from god and so in Luke, in Luke 5, there's a similar hearing of a crippled man who had friends. Remember, they tore the roof off his friends and they lowered him down to Jesus. So they were getting him closer to Jesus. So that means that friendship is important to God. As a matter of fact, in Ecclesiastics 4, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, he says, Two are better than one, for they have a good return for their labor. It says, When one falls down, the other can pick him up. It says, but pity the man who, when he falls, has no one to pick him up. So the Lord is concerned, amen, with relationships. It's important. Friends can also have a negative influence on us. Uh, uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, bad company corrupts good morals. So that means if we go around the, round, the, the, go around the wrong friends, they could mess us up. They could change us, amen, into that. So I got a question for us. Do we have friends that bring us closer to Christ? Or, or do we have friends that take us away from Christ? That, that's how we, we, we're able to evaluate our circle. Because if we want to get stronger, we need to be around friends that are going to pull us closer to Christ. Now, this morning, I want to bring out four things that we have to do to see clearly. And we're going to pick it up from the story here. Four things we have to do to see clearly. Number one. You have to surrender. We have to surrender. And surrendering means you allow him to lead you. That's all surrender means. When we surrender to somebody, it's like, okay, I'm giving you permission to lead me. And we get that from verse 42. It says, taking him by the hand, he led him out of the village. What happened? Jesus took him, the blind man, by the hand. So the blind man had to surrender unto Jesus. And, and, and so surrendering to God means letting go of our plans and letting God have His way in every aspect of our lives. It means allowing Him to, gu to guide our steps and to direct our decisions. And as Christians, this means we surrender our will for His perfect will and follow God. So here you have the blind man. His friends took him 
to Jesus. How many know our friends can tell us, hey, come to church, come here, hey, somebody loves you? But it's until we surrender our personal life that we won't have an experience with God. So it says, taking him by the hand, he led him up. So now there was a transfer. His friends took him there. Now the blind man had to come to the place where he had to surrender. I can't see, but I'm trusting that God, you're going to take me to where I need to go. And so the story goes on and it says, Jesus led him out of the village. Jesus didn't do nothing while he was in the village. But let me just say this, surrender positions us for God's best. Whenever you want God's best for your life, physically, spiritual, financially, we have to surrender that area to Him. Uh, uh, God, how many know God won't make us surrender? He's not going to be there like, man, that's it, you better surrender or, or I'm going to punish you. That's not God. His grace and His mercy I mean, is always there for us and He's always trying to position us to a place where we say, okay, God, I give you this area. Sometimes it takes longer for individuals because we're stubborn. Right? All, all of us got stubbornness in us. I mean, you know, no, God, I don't want to do that right now. Man, no, it's not my time, God. No, eventually I'll get there. And, and so God says, okay, I'm just going to wait for you. You know, I'm going to wait for you. My grace and mercy is there. So God won't make us sur surrender because he's given us a free will. Amen. And, and, but however, uh, how many know our way doesn't work for the Lord? No, God, that doesn't work like that. I, I don't want you to move like that. I want you to, know, to move like this. How many know God knows best what's good for our life? Why does he know best? Because he created us. Something you create, it's like a man, manufacturer of a car. You buy a car, they'll give you instructions. You look up that car, it'll tell you how fast it can go. It'll tell you the capabilities. It gives you the whole run. Why? Because they created that car. Just like Christ, he created us so he knows what's best for our lives and and he doesn't want us to miss out on all the great rewards or suffer the consequences of our wrong choices because how I many know every choice is a consequence meaning that we either surrender to god or we surrender to self when we surrender to self sometimes we make wrong choices and there's consequences that come with the wrong choices and a lot of times we make wrong choices and then we're like god take me out of here and he's like wait a minute you made that choice, so now the consequences you have to deal with. And that's where we don't like it. Let me just give some things why people won't surrender. We simply don't want to submit. That's the number one thing. God, I don't surrender to you because I'm not ready yet. I, I don't want to be sold out like that. I want to come to church and just feel good. Amen. And people that don't want to submit or surrender to God, sometimes that's the stubbornness or the pride. I don't need it right now. Or, or we don't like giving up control. That's what surrender means. We're giving up control. And, 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 and the way we're created, sometimes it's like, no, I'm in control of this situation. When we understand that God is in control, we're like, okay, here it is, God. Whatever you want me to do, God, I'm going to surrender to you. And that, I mean, and that is hard, giving up control. Because we're like, I'm a grown man, or I'm an adult, man. I, I could make my own choice. God is saying, that's true. You could make your, cho your own choices, but I got my best for you. I got everything to provide for you. Now, when you surrender to me, you can open up all those doors because favor will follow you. And, and, but when we don't see it like that, like, I'm not going to give you control. You mean, what, what do you mean I have to read? What do you mean I have to have a relationship with you? I can't even feel you. I can't even see you, God. So this doesn't make sense. And, but that's surrendering to God. Sometimes we are afraid of what God might ask us to do, right? I don't want to surrender, God, because from the very beginning, I have that voice inside that I called you to greatness. And we're like, I'm afraid, God, of, of what you're going to ask me to do. I, I can't do that. You know, that when God started calling me at a, at a young age, like, you're going to preach again. No, I'm not. I, I, I don't even read. I can't even study. I don't even like this stuff. You know, I just got saved to raise a family and be good, you know, and, and, and get a right mind. That's why I got saved. God, give me a right mind. Get me off of drugs, God, and let me be a family man. That was it. You know, and, oh no, God, and I know I'm afraid, God. <laughs> what if I mess up? I would say that all the time in the beginning. God, how can I do that? What if I make a mistake? What if I, I mess up? And then he would say, the only way you're going to mess up is when you stop surrendering to me. You know, and so when I understood that, I was like, wow, that's it, God? Man, I, because as long as we're in this flesh, our mind is going to run, you know. Uh, 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 my mind still runs at times. I got to bring it back into, uh, 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 the Bible says that, you know, we control the flesh. Paul says, I, I, I beat my body and put it into subjection so my body won't tell me what to do, but I tell my body what to do. What was Paul saying? That when I'm spiritual, 
I'm able to control my flesh. When I'm not, the flesh is going to control me. But a lot of times we're afraid of what God might ask us to do. Amen. What are you afraid of this morning? Think about that. What are you afraid of this morning? You know, uh, because a lot of times God created it. Let me say it like this. God created all of us with a purpose. All, you can do things I can't do because we're each unique in that own, the way God designed us. You can reach people I can't reach. But a lot of times when we don't respond to what God wants us to do, people with that God puts us in, because it's not a coincidence when you run into people at the market, at the coffee shop, at the donut shop. At the, it's, it's not a coincidence. That's why sometimes God keeps putting people in front of you. Why? Because he wants you to minister to him, whether you just say, hey, Jesus loves you, and that's it. You know? But a lot of times we're afraid. We're afraid. You know? When we start learning to trust God, it's going to make it more simpler. Another reason why people don't sub submit is because they don't trust God. You know, we don't trust God. Uh, we don't believe His way is, be is the best. We think we can do a better job than God. That's what we're saying when we don't surrender. I know it sounds hard, and it sounds, man, that's, that's like, that's whoa, but it's truth. When we don't surrender to God, we're telling God, my way is better. You know, but sometimes when we hear it like that, like, what do you mean? No, that's not true. I, I want to trust God, but... I'm really learning how to trust God. And God understands that. But you're going to have to get to a place where you say, man, just it's like when you go to a pool or you go to the beach. Are you the type of person that puts your foot in the water and like, oh, it's cold. I, I got to wait. Or do you just jump in? You know, we just got to jump in, God, and say, okay, God, here it is. Here I am. Whatever you want to do with me. So how can we surrender? Amen. The way we surrender to God is you have to know who we're surrendering to. When we understand how big God is, when we understand that God is a creator of everything, that, that God is never late, amen, on his promises, and that God will provide everything for us, how I many know it's easy to trust someone like that? It's like your friend. You, all of us has that, have that one friend that we can trust. Oh, no, if they, if they say they're going to do it, I know they're going to do it. You know, and that's the way it is with God. When we start understanding who God is and, and, and what God is capable, we start taking the limits off of our mind. God, I'm not going to use my logic here because you're not logic. I mean, everything you do, God, is supernatural. It does not make sense. How can you touch my life, God, when I was going in one direction, you gave me it? That doesn't make sense, God. I don't understand that. But God says, yeah, but when you trust me, you start knowing who I am. Amen. So we're, we're yielding to a good, powerful, loving, and all-wise God. God is worthy of our submission. Amen. And, and so when we get look back at the story here, the first touch, Jesus took the man by the hand and led him out of the town. Christ has taken him by the hand, but nothing has changed in the first touch. Amen. But now the two have a relationship. See, the man had to trust him. So the man let Jesus take him by, a hand, by the hand. The first thing that Christ longs for is a personal relationship with us. Because we come in blind, meaning that we don't understand this. We, we didn't have an afterlife and came back, you know. And, and, oh, yeah, my, I knew what Chris Randy before. All of us, this is new. All the, to me, this is new. When I got to say, when I first heard people speaking in tongues, I, that scared the heck out of me. I was like, whoa, what language is that, you know? What do you mean you have to be like this? What do you, it's all new to us. And so it's a personal relationship because storms will come, winds will blow, your body will still uh, 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 be filled with pain, circumstances will still seem the same way, but now the difference is you have a relationship with God. So when he let Christ take him by the hand, that was signifying, man, now I got, a, I got my first touch. That's a relationship with God. The first touch was not to change him, but to bring him out of his environment of doubt, fear, and destruction. That was the first touch. When we have a relationship with God, then all of a sudden, for some of us, we were broken. Some of us, we were crying. God, I thank you. I felt different. And it's weird at first because it's like it's a feeling you never felt before. And you're like, I don't want to cry, man, 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 man. But then when you get into his presence, you start understanding that, man, what happened? You start saying, what happened, God? You know, man. And, and then when you understand it, it's the Holy Spirit doing the work. And so God did it to bring him out of his environment because he doubted that he can be healed. He doubted. He had fear. He had destruction. And, and how many know he deals with us according to our need? Whatever need you have, the Lord will deal with you according to your need. He dealt with this poor blind man privately by taking him outside the village in order to heal him. 
You see, when God deals with us, he makes it personal. Every one of us, we got different needs. But God is so big. God is so powerful. And all he's asking is, let me lead you by the hand. The question is, are we allowing him to lead us by giving him our hand? And even though our, the, his friends brought him to Christ, amen, God is not trying to meet the expectations of the crowd. God took him away from the crowd. Amen. God says, let me take you outside. How many understand surrendering is a process? It's a process. All our life, we are going to surrender. Our whole life. It's not just a, a one-time event. God, I surrender today. I'm good. He says, no, you got to surrender every day. Every day we got to surrender. Amen. And, and, and he wants to know, can you follow him when things are tough? Can you follow him even when you don't see anything? The man didn't take Jesus by the hand. Jesus took him by the hand. Remember that. He didn't say, okay, let Jesus, give me your hand. No, Jesus said, give me your hand. And the man gave him his hand. Jesus has a hold on him. Just like Jesus has a hold on you, Jesus has a hold on me. So the good news for us this morning is my hand may slip, but Christ has a hold on me. We may make some mistakes, but Christ has a hold on me. Amen. I may fail and stumble, but Christ has a hold on me. I may be running like a wild person, but Christ has a hold on me. And that's good news for you and for me, that as long as Christ is holding our hand, He will lead us in the right direction. Amen. And He took them out. If you want to grow in your faith, there are certain places you shouldn't go. Amen. He took them out of, out of the place there. He, he took them out of the Bethsaida. Amen. And, and why didn't He heal them there? Because he was saying, this is, in this environment that you're in, there's never going to be a healing for you. You know, and when you understand that, you're going to say, wow, I need to change my environment in order for God to do a work in me. A lot of times we don't want to change our environment. We want God to, to work with God. I'm here and I'm not going to change my circumstance. But you come and God says, no, no, just give me your hand and let me lead you up to another environment. That way I can do what I want to do in your life. Whether that's changing friends, changing circumstances, changing our lifestyle, let God do what He wants to do. Amen. Now, the second thing that takes place here, you have to be honest with Christ. You have to be honest with Christ. And we go here in, in, in verse 24 and 26. He says, He put spit in the man's eyes, laid hands on him and asked him, Do you see anything? In verse 24 and 26, he looked up and said, I see men, they look like walking trees. See, he was honest with God. Sometimes we're not honest with God, where God gives us, touches us the first time, and then God says, well, everybody, how you do? I'm doing great now. But the man didn't say that. He didn't say, I could see. He goes, now I see men, but they look like walking trees. In other words, my vision's still blurry. My healing's not complete. I still need help. I still need work in my life. Amen. So he was honest with God. And his honesty gave him sight he did not have. See, that's what honesty does. It gives us sight, amen. He could have said, Lord, I, I see all things clear. But he didn't say that. He was honest with God, amen. And, and, and life with blurry vision is dangerous. Some of us as believers, we get that first touch. Okay, God. But then we walk around with blurred vision. We don't see God's purpose for our life. We don't see God's purpose for our family. We don't see God's purpose for our future. So we just walk around with blurred vision. Vision. How many know blurred vision is dangerous? I remember when, when I was 50 and I had cataracts at a young age, and even doctors said, Man, you're too young to have them. So my wife drove me around for a few months and it was horrible. You know, I mean, not, not in that sense. Let me explain that. <laughs> she drove me around because I couldn't see. And then even when I would preach, I had my paper, big old fonts in my papers because I couldn't see. I said, Man, I got to go get surgery on this. But one day she was driving, and, and it was dark, and we had our windows tinted real dark, and at that time we had a different car, and we thought it was a driveway, and it was a curb, you know, and I said, man, I said, no, I, I, I got to get my eyes fixed, because she can barely drive as it is, you know, I got to see, so I, I went ahead, but I, I got used to just blurred vision, I would preach, I would see everybody blurred, I, it don't matter, you know, I'm good like this, but then sometimes we can get comfortable with blurred vision, the blind man here, his vision was blurred, but he was honest with God. 
this morning, what is our condition spiritually? For some, we may say, man, God, uh, because as we read on, when God gave him the second touch, he said he had 20-20 vision. That's perfect vision. You see, we could either ask God by being honest, God, here I am this morning. Here I am watching on YouTube. Here I am, God, and I may not see everything clearly. I don't understand. Things are blurred, God. I'm confused. But when we're honest with God, he's able to touch us a second time where we can have 20-20 vision. But too many times we, we get satisfied with blurred vision. I'm happy just going to church. I'm, I'm happy just doing this. And, and that can be a mistake because God has so much for us. And when we understand that God has so much for us, it's going to make it easier for us. Now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, this is the Apostle Paul. He had a special pr prayer for his friends. And he says like this, I ask, ask the God of our Master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing Him personally, then there's a comma. Your eyes focus and clear, and then there's a comma, so that you can see exactly what it is He is calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life He has for His followers, all the utter extravagance of His work in us, who trust Him, endless energy, and boundless strength. See, the Apostle Paul was praying for his friends, and he says, man, I, I pray that, that, that God make you intelligent and discerning and knowing Him personally. And then there's a comma. Then he's saying in stages, and when we know Him personally, your eyes focus and clear. And then there's a comma. Why do we need to be doing that? So that you can see exactly what He's calling you to do. See, Paul's praying for the people that their eyes be open. And when we understand that, we're going to say, God, I need to be honest with you, God. And when I'm honest with you, God, I'm able to focus on what you called me to do. And there's even another scripture in Psalms 119, verse 18. He says, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. This is the psalmist writing it. David, open my eyes to see the wonderful truth. And he's asking the Lord, God, I need my eyes open. Amen? And, and, and like I said, some believers are satisfied with blurred vision. And, and when you're satisfied with blurred vision, you're going to make comments like this. Life is always going to be this way. I'm always going to struggle. How I many know that's a life from the pits of hell? We don't have to struggle serving the Lord. God gives us breakthrough. God gives us victory. There's going to be times we walk in the valley. But, but even the psalmist says, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, God, you are with me. Amen. And so there's going to be times where, where we say, man, my family's always going to be like this, man. My marriage is always going to struggle because we're not compatible. Ministry, my ministry is never going to grow. I'm never going to be what you call me to be. And, and those, those, are, those are people that still have blurred vision. Another scripture in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are more blessed. Amen. And, and so when we get these scriptures, we say, God, I got to be honest with you. Now, the third thing is you can't get the second touch if you're not honest about the first touch. Because a lot of people say, God, touch me, God. I need a touch. And God saying, well, you're not even being honest with me. Because the, the reality is he knows everything about us. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives in us. So the Holy Spirit is with us 24-7, sees everything we do, and He's waiting for us as a father to be honest with Him. It's almost like those that have kids, when you ask your kids something, and, they, no, no, and you know they're not okay. I mean, no, as parents, you know when your kids are, are, are not okay. You see them, you feel it, you sense it. People that are close to you know when you're not doing well, they can see you, hey, how's everything? I'm doing okay. No, you're not. I know you. And our fathers are like that, but we can't get a second touch if we're not honest about the first touch. And that's in verse 26. It says, So Jesus laid hands on his eyes again. The man looked hard and realized that he had not recovered perfect sight, saw everything in bright 2020 focus. Jesus sent him straight home, telling him, Don't enter the village. So by being honest, it allowed Jesus to touch him a second time. Too many believers are not being honest about the first touch, so they can never experience the second touch. Let me ask us a question, amen. I don't want to hear your answers because I got my own issues, amen. <laughs> uh, what are you not being honest to God about? Think about that. What are you not being honest to God about? Because once we learn to surrender that to Him, then we're able to get a second touch. What does that second touch do? 
take us to the next level. A lot of us don't experience the next level, the power of God, because we're not honest about the first touch. Yeah, God, you touched me, but God, that was way back then. I need a new touch, Father. Today, I may be struggling, God. Today, God, I'm just going through the motion, God. I need that second touch, amen. And then number four, you can't go back to what he's taking you out of. Once he took him out of the city, Jesus sent him home and told him, don't go back into the village, amen. And you can say, what's that all about? Why did Jesus tell him uh, uh, not to go back, you know? Because sometimes we want to go back to what God pulled us out of. I want to go back to that relationship. I want to go back to this. I want to, you know, it was okay, you know. And, and sometimes we get, get, get around toxic people. And what they do is they pull all our energy out. And God has said, okay, you got to leave them alone now. No, I want to go back there. And God has said, no, I pulled you out of there. I'm giving you strength, amen, for you can continue to go out. And you're like, no, I don't want to. See, we need to understand uh, that there are places we're not going to find God. In Bethsaida, they couldn't do that. They were so cold, Jesus couldn't even do miracles there. He only did a few because they didn't receive him. And when we understand that, that there's going to be people that, that, that when we're around, they're not going to encourage our faith. Amen. So Jesus told them, don't go back there. And, and when we understand that, we're going to be able to understand that God gives you sight for your future, not your past. He pulled them out of his past. He was stuck in his past. Hey, here I am. I'm blind. You know, and, and he wasn't blind before because he goes, I see men like trees. How did he know what trees look like? How did he know what men looked like if he was blind his whole life? So somewhere down the line, something happened where blindness came upon him. Now Jesus took him out there, and Jesus is saying, Okay, I took you out of Bethsaida where you were at, because that wasn't a good environment for you. And he says, Now don't go back there. You know, I, I've given you sight. I've given you 20-20 vision for your future, not your past. Too many of us want to keep looking back, it's almost like, like the lady in the Bible, that, uh, um, who was it, that looked back and she became a pillar of salt? Lot's wife. Lot's wife. She looked back. And then what happened? She became a pillar of salt. Now, you, there's all kinds of stories with Lot's wife that you can say, you know, maybe her husband wasn't leading her the right way, that everything that was good was in the past. You know, that's why she looked back. See, there's a lot of things you can talk about that story. But here, Jesus tells them, don't look back. So when God touches us, we're not meant to go back to the same circle he pulled us out. And I think we need to understand that. And God is saying, I've given you sight for your future. Why do you keep going back to this place here? Amen. Because every time you go back, your, your vision gets blurred again. And, and I like where it says he gave them 20-20 vision. I mean, no, everything God does is perfect. Everything God does is perfect. When he rescued us, that was God's perfect timing for our life. Amen. And so this morning, I want to encourage us that when we understand, you know, that we have to continue to allow God to touch our lives. But the only, the only reason, the only way he's going to be able to touch our lives is when we continue to stay honest with him. Honest with him. So this morning, as we close, amen, I, I want to ask us a question again. What are you not being honest to God about? Think about that. Because sometimes we, we, we do what the book of James says, that when, a person, when you look in the mirror and you walk away, you forget what, the mirror, what you look like. And the mirror of God represents there at that time in the book of James is the Word of God, God's Word, God's promises. So he's saying when we look in the mirror and we see ourselves, let's not say everything is good and walk away. He says, let, let us be honest with God. Amen. We have to come and say, God, here I am this morning, God. I may be here, God, but I need that second touch. You want the second touch? We've got to be honest with you. Those watching on YouTube, if you want that second touch, wherever you're at, you got to be honest with God. Here I am, God, I'm frustrated with my kids. Here I am, I'm frustrated in my marriage. Here I am, I'm frustrated in my current condition. And frustration may just be not so much that you're fed up with and you're ready to, to quit, but you're just frustrated because, man, God, I don't see everything working out on my time. And God is saying, that's because you went back to Bethsaida. You went back to where I pulled you out of. That's why you're never going to get ahead. So we're going to close in a word of prayer. Amen. And I'm going to pray for all of us that we say, God, let us continue to be honest, God, with you, for we can continue to be the best you called us to be. Father, we first of all thank you 
We thank you for those are, that are here, God, with us this morning, those that are going to watch in YouTube, Father. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, Father. Lord, I pray this morning, God, that we can be honest with you, just like the blind man, Father. You touched him once, but he was honest. He said, man, everything is blurry, Father. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're listening to this prayer, and you say, man, this is blurry here in my life. When we give that to the Lord, and we say, God, here it is, God. God is able to touch us a second time. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit, God, will just begin to touch, will begin to encourage, will begin to uplift, Father. God, take us to another level. But God, at the same time, when you take us out of Aseda, let us not go back, Father God. There's such great things you want to do through our life, Father. Let us learn to surrender, God. And in the surrendering, God, we have to be honest if we want the second touch, Father. And we come against the enemy, my God, that has been lying to believers, been lying to the people that are watching, the people that are here, Father. We pray, God, you put your arms around them and let them know, God, that you are there with them, Father. And God, we're careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise this morning, Lord. And everyone said, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you. Amen.